Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. If this is your first time watching this show, let me give you a quick rundown on what we're all about. Here on the Commander's Quarters, we build fun and inexpensive focused commander decks. A focused commander deck is more tuned than a casual deck, but not quite to the level of a competitive or optimized deck. Our Commander's Quarters decks are built within a $25 budget. That's $25 for 100 cards. But before we get started on today's deck tech, why don't you go click that subscribe button down there to make sure that you're up to date on the latest Commander's Quarters deck techs. Today's episode is a special one. It is a patron-selected deck tech. Once a month, patrons of the Commander's Quarters get to vote on a commander that they'd like to see in an upcoming show. And the commander that received the most votes for this patron-selected deck tech was Adeliz the Cinderwind. Adeliz is a 2-2 human wizard with flying in haste that costs one blue and a red. She has whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, wizards you control get plus one plus one until the end of the turn. Adeliz is an interesting card to build around and you can try to take her in a lot of different directions. The first direction that I tried to take with her was a quick and explosive deck with a lot of evasive wizards. I found that while this deck could work really well in 1v1, it's actually not that good in multiplayer because it runs out of gas far too quickly. Unlike Zada, Adeliz can't really pump your team quick enough or draw you enough cards in order to kill three other players. The second direction that I tried to take with her was a storm build. I quickly found though that in order to get those cards that you truly need to make that build work, you'd have to go well out of the budget. So what approach did I take? Let's check out our strategy to find out. Our strategy with this deck is going to be to cast wizards that have valuable enter the battlefield effects and we're going to stay alive as long as we can. Once we establish a board presence, we can either swing big with those wizards or we can combo off in multiple different ways. I found that with this approach I can make a much more focused and consistent deck. As with all Commander's Quarters decks, I'm going to break this deck down into 10 different tactics that show you how the deck works and how you're going to win with it. Let's go on to tactic number one, we will rock you. Even though we have a low average converted mana cost for this deck, we still need a little bit of ramp. And with the right hand and the right amount of ramp to start off the game, we can even win as early as turn four. By paying two, we can tap and sacrifice Wayfarer's Bobble to search our library for a basic land and put into play tapped. Mindstone is a mana rock that costs two and taps for a colorless, and we can pay one to tap and sacrifice it to draw a card. Then there's Sky Diamond and Fire Diamond, which both enter the battlefield tapped. Sky Diamond is going to tap for a blue, and Fire Diamond will tap for a red. Sphere of the Suns enters the battlefield tapped with three charge counters on it, and we can tap it to remove a charge counter and add one mana of any color. Next up is Star Compass, which enters the battlefield tapped, and we can tap it to add one mana of any color that a basic land we control could produce. Then there's Ezit Signet, which we can pay one to tap it to add blue-red. Finally, while not a mana rock, Goblin Electromancer is a great addition to the deck. He has instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast, and since we're running a ton of those spells in this deck, he's going to come in huge. Alright, so we've talked about the ramp package, now let's talk about some cards that help illustrate what the deck really wants to do. Let's go on to tactic number two, cause and effect. Nabon, Dean of Iteration has, if a wizard entering the battlefield under your control causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. We are running a ton of wizards that have enter the battlefield effects, and with Nabon in play, they will trigger twice. And he's also going to cause a card like Impact Tremors to trigger twice. Impact Tremors is an enchantment that has, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, Impact Tremors deals one damage to each opponent. Then there's Outpost Siege, which isn't going to be affected by Nabon, but it does have two modes that are going to be effective in this deck. When it enters the battlefield, we can either choose cons or dragons. If we choose cons, at the beginning of our upkeep, we're going to exile the top card of our library, and until the end of the turn, we can play that card. If we choose dragons, whenever a creature we control leaves the battlefield, it's going to deal 1 damage to target creature or player. So its first mode can help us generate some temporary card advantage, but its second mode is what we're going to use for some of our combos. Both Impact Tremors and Outpost Siege are huge additions to the deck, and we'll get through those combos later to show you how they fit in. Next up is Docent of Perfection, which is a huge token generator for the deck. It's a 5-4 flyer that has, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a 1-1 blue human wizard creature token onto the battlefield, then if you control 3 or more wizards, transform Dose into Perfection. It transforms into Final Iteration, which is a 6-5 flyer that has wizards you control get plus 2 plus 1 and have flying, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a 1-1 blue human wizard creature token onto the battlefield. This can get out of hand very quickly. We are running a ton of instants and sorceries in this deck, and it's going to create a lot of wizards. Also, giving all of our wizards plus two, plus one, and flying makes them even more of a threat. So in general, this deck just wants to cast a ton of wizards and a ton of instants and sorceries. So let's go through some of those wizards now with tactic number three, Wizard's Chess. We're running a few wizards that have some enter the battlefield effects that help us disrupt what our opponents are doing. When Harbinger of Tides enters the battlefield, we can return target tapped creature and opponent controls back to their owner's hand. We can also cast this with Flash if we pay two extra. Then there's Exclusion Mage and Aether Adept, both of which can bounce a creature back to their owner's hand, though Exclusion Mage can only target our opponent's creatures. 
When Stern Proctor enters the battlefield, we can return target artifact or enchantment back to its owner's hand. This can even come in handy for us if we want to bounce something like Outpost Siege so we can recast it and then choose a different mode. Next up is Portal Mage, which has Flash, and when it enters the battlefield during the Declare Attacker step, we can reselect which player or Planeswalker target attacking creature is attacking. So not only does this help us prevent a huge attacker from coming at us, but it also sends that attacker at someone else that they probably didn't want to attack. Then there's Mizzia Meddler, which has Flash, and when it enters the battlefield, we can change a target of target spell or ability to Mizzia Meddler. It's overall just a really good card that helps us disrupt some of those things that our opponents want to do. Alright, so we've talked about some wizards that help us disrupt our opponents and what they want to do. Now let's talk about some of the ones that help us with our game plan. Let's go on to tactic number four, it's all coming back. With this deck, we're going to cast a ton of instants and sorcery, so having some wizards that help us recur those cards are huge additions to the deck. Whenever Archaeomancer, Salvager of Secrets, or Is It Chronarch enter the battlefield, they're going to return target instant or sorcery card from our graveyard to our hand. This can be huge in getting us back a crucial card that we need to either help us win the game or prevent our opponents from doing so. We're also running some instants and sorceries that we can continuously cast and recur with these three cards. For example, we're running some flicker effects that will exile one of these creatures and then bring them back to the battlefield. When they come back, they can bring us back that card and we can keep recasting it. We're also running some cards that can create a token copy of a creature. When that token enters the battlefield, we can get that card back and then continuously cast it for as much mana as we have. These effects can come in huge in this deck, especially when Adalys is in play, because it's going to pump our team for each one of those instants and sorceries we cast. But how are we going to get to all those instants and sorceries? Let's go on to tactic number 5, Research Assistance. We are running a ton of wizards that either scry or draw us cards when they enter the battlefield. When Omen Speaker enters the battlefield, we're going to scry too. Then there's Augur of Bullis, and when it enters the battlefield, we're going to look at the top three cards of our library. We can reveal an instant or sorcery from among them and put it into our hand and the rest on the bottom of our library in any order. As an additional cost to cast Silvergill Adept, we're going to reveal a Merfolk card from our hand or we have to pay an extra three. But when it enters the battlefield, we'll get to draw a card. Merchant of Secrets is also going to draw us a card, but doesn't have that same restriction. Then there's Seagate Oracle, and when it enters the battlefield, we get to look at the top two cards of our library, and we get to put one of them into our hand, and the other on the bottom of our library. When Champion of Wits enters the battlefield, we'll draw cards equal to its power, and then discard two cards. Most of the time, this is going to be just two, but if we eternalize it, it's going to come in for four. Next up is Riverwise Augur, and when it enters the battlefield, we'll draw three cards, and put two cards from our hand on top of our library in any order. Again, we talked about some of the spells in this deck that either flicker creatures or they create a copy of a creature. So if we do that with these wizards, we're going to be drawing a ton of cards. Then there's Magus of the Wheel, who can also draw us a ton of cards just on his own. By paying one in a red, we can tap and sacrifice him in order to make everyone discard their hand and then draw seven cards. And finally, there's a zombie Lady of Scrolls who has tap and untap wizard you control, draw a card. With the zombie in play, we can draw a ton of cards since we're running a lot of wizards in this deck. Now there are not just wizards in this deck that help us draw cards, but there's also some other spells that help too. Let's go on to tactic number 6, Research Experts. We are running a ton of card draw in this deck, not just to dig deeper for more wizards and more instants and sorceries, but also to dig for our combo pieces. Opt and Brainstorm can both be huge early on in the game to help us set ourselves up. Opt is going to let us scry one and then draw a card, and Brainstorm is going to have us draw three cards and then put any two cards from our hand on top of our library in any order. Words of Wisdom is going to have us draw two cards, and then each other player is going to get to draw a card. And then Vision Skeins is going to have everyone just straight up draw two cards. Now both of these cards may help our opponents, but we're really just trying to help set ourselves up and then get to those combo pieces as well. Next up is Thirst for Knowledge, which is going to draw us three cards, and then we have to discard two cards unless we discard an artifact card. Factor Fiction is going to have us reveal the top five cards of our library, and the opponent's going to separate those into two different piles, and we get to choose one of those piles. That pile will go into our hand, the other one goes into our graveyard. Epiphany the Drown Yard is pretty much going to do the exact same thing, but it does it for X. Then there's Pull from Tomorrow, which is going to have us draw X cards, and then we have to discard one card. Stroke of Genius is going to make target player draw X cards, and Blue Sun Zenith will do the exact same, but it's also going to shuffle into our library. Now you may have noticed that each and every single one of these spells is at instant speed. It's very important that we have flexibility with this deck so that we can pick and choose what spells we're going to be casting during our opponent's turns. Let's go over some of those spells now in tactic number 7, I wouldn't do that. Again, we really just don't want to tap out and leave us vulnerable to our opponents, so again, we're going to have some cards at instant speed that can help us. Into the Royal is going to bounce one target non-land permanent back to its owner's hand, and if it was kicked, we get to draw a card. Then there's Blusher Squall or Ensnare, which we can either use offensively or defensively depending on the situation. If we overload Bluster Squall, we're going to tap down every single creature that we don't control. And Ensnare is going to tap down every single creature, but we can also just return two islands back to our hand instead of paying its mana cost. These cards can either help us prevent our opponents from attacking us, or they can help us when we're swinging through at our opponents. Then there's Aetherize, which is going to return all attacking creatures to their owner's hands. And then Evacuation is just going to straight up return all creatures to their owner's hands. 
We really only want to have to use evacuation if we absolutely have to, but again, we have a ton of creatures with enter the battlefield effects, so it's not that big of a deal. Then we've got some combat tricks up our sleeve. Domineering Will is going to let us gain control of three creatures so that we can block with them. Reigns of Power is going to allow us to switch our creatures out for someone else's so that we can block with those as well. And then Illusionist Gambit is going to force our opponent that attacked us to take those creatures back and swing at another opponent with all those creatures. With Adaliz on the field, our opponents might already be hesitant to attack us since they don't know how many times we can pump our team, but it's nice to have a backup plan with all these protection spells. Alright, so we've talked about generating value with our cards, we've talked about protecting ourselves, now it's time to talk about how to set up those combos. Let's go on to tactic number 8, go get it. We're running two tutors in this deck that help us search for some of those pieces of the combos. First up there's Vidalcan Aether Mage, which is a 1-2 wizard with flash and when it comes into play we can return a sliver back to its owner's hand, but that part really doesn't matter to us. The part that does matter to us is that it has wizard cycling, which we can pay 3 and discard it and then search our library for any wizard and put into our hand. And we'll talk about who we're going to be searching for in the next tactic. By transmuting Drift of Phantasms, we can search our library for any card that has a converted mana cost of 3. And as luck would have it, most of our combo pieces cost 3 mana. Again, while it is important to have a ton of card draw in our deck and we can get to those combo pieces just by drawing, it is nice to have these tutors in the deck to ensure that we can actually get to them when we need them. Alright, so let's get on to those combo pieces now in tactic number 9, Master Casters. Naru Meha, Master Wizard, is a 3-3 human wizard with flash, and when it enters the battlefield we can copy target instant or sorcery spell we control and choose a new target for that copy. And then other wizards we control get plus one plus one. The buff to wizards is nice, but the real reason that we have her in the deck is for that enter the battlefield trigger. But before we talk about any of the combos that work with Naru Meha, let's talk about a wizard that does it even better. Dualcaster Mage is the golden pig of the deck. Dualcaster Mage is a 2-2 human wizard with flash, and when it enters the battlefield we get to copy target instant or sorcery spell, and we can choose new targets for that copy. Now this card is very similar to Narumeha, but with some subtle differences, and let's go into those now. Unlike Narumeha, Dualcaster Mage can target opponent spells, and while this doesn't help us with our combos, it can come in handy in a game. But the main and most important difference between Dualcaster Mage and Narumeha is that it's not legendary. Let me walk you through one of the combos to show you why this is important. So one of the cards that you can combo with is Heat Shimmer, which is going to put a token into play that's a copy of target creature. It gains haste and at the end of the turn, remove this permanent from the game. With this combo, we will need a creature in play to start. So let's say it's Omen Speaker. We cast Heat Shimmer, targeting Omen Speaker to create a copy of Omen Speaker. But while Heat Shimmer is still on the stack and before it resolves, we're going to cast Dual Caster Mage, targeting Heat Shimmer. This will then create a copy of Heat Shimmer, which we can then target the Dual Caster Mage with. By doing that, we're going to create another copy of Dualcaster Mage, which can create another copy of Heat Shimmer, and so on and so forth. Basically, we can do this as many times as we want over and over again. The end result is that we're going to have a near infinite amount of Dualcaster Mages in play that have haste. And unless one of our opponents has a way to stop this giant army of Dualcaster Mages, we can kill all of our opponents at once. We can even kill all of our opponents without even having to attack with these creatures if we have Impact Tremors or Outpost Siege. Impact Tremors will kill them all right away, and Outpost Siege can kill them at the end of the turn once all of our tokens leave the battlefield. Now remember how I said there was an important distinction between Dualcaster Mage and Narumeha? Again, Narumeha is legendary, so unfortunately anytime we're creating a token copy of Narumeha, we have to sacrifice that token. With Narumeha though, we can still continuously copy her and the Heat Shimmer over and over again. So in order to win with Narumeha, we need to either have Impact Tremors or Outpost Siege in play when we do this combo. So now that you understand the basic premise of these combos, let's go through some more cards that we can combo with. Next up there's Twin Flame, which is even better than Heat Shimmer in this deck. Twin Flame does the exact same thing, but we actually don't need a creature on board since we don't have to target any creatures to start off with. Then there's Faded Infatuation, which is going to let us create a token that's a copy of target creature we control, and if it's our turn we get to scry too. And Cackling Counterpart also creates a token, but even has flashback for 5 blue blue. Now unlike with Heat Shimmer and Twin Flame, these tokens won't have haste. The good thing though is that these cards are at instant speed so we can do it right before our turn and set ourselves up to win. These next cards actually need a little more help to help us win, but can still generate infinite combos that are very valuable to us. With something like Impact Tremors in play or Outpost Siege, we just win right away too. Displace is going to let us exile two creatures we control, so along with Dualcaster Mage for the combo, we can also exile one of our other creatures with a good enter the battlefield effect. Some of our creatures will let us draw a ton of cards, they can bounce our opponent's permanents back to their hands, and so on and so forth. Then there's Ghostly Flicker, which can actually generate infinite mana with Dualcaster Mage. With the Ghostly Flicker combo, we can either bounce another one of our creatures or one of our lands. When that land comes back into play, it's going to come into play untapped and we can tap it before it bounces back out again. Then there's Illusionist Stratagem, which is going to bounce two of our creatures and then we get to draw a card. So again, we can do this as many times as we want to, drawing through our deck until we find the correct card to win the game. Then there's Essence Flux, which will only let us bounce one creature. 
So this card will only really win us the game if we have either Impact Tremors or Outpost Siege in play. Release to the Wind works in a similar way since when we get that combo going we can recast Dualcaster Mage for free at flash speed. Now the thing about all these combo pieces is that they aren't just randomly added to the deck. All of these cards synergize very well with the deck, so even if you don't have the combo, you can still use these cards to help you win. You can flicker or create a token of one of your wizards that has a great enter the battlefield effect to help you out. And if you need to change the target of a game winning spell with Dualcaster Mage, you can. But when we do have one of these combos, it's a good idea to make sure that we're protecting it to make sure that it goes off. So let's go on to tactic number 10, just in case. We are running three counter spells in this deck, including Is It Charm. Is it Charm plays a lot of different roles for us since it will allow us to either counter a target non-creature spell unless its controller pays two, we can deal two damage to target creature, or we can draw two cards and discard two cards. It's a very flexible spell that really comes in handy in a variety of different circumstances. Then there's Arcane Denial, which not only counters a spell, but it's going to have that spell's controller draw two cards and us draw one card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. Finally, there's Wizard's Retort, which costs one less if we control a wizard, so it's basically just counter spell. Alright, now that we've gone through all the cards that help you win with the deck, let's go through the cards that help make it happen. It's time to go on to the mana base. We are going to be running 35 lands in this deck, including Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which you can tap and sacrifice to search your library for a basic land and put into play tapped. Then there's Grixis Panorama, which can either tap for a colorless, or you can pay one and tap and sacrifice it to search for your basic land. Warp Landscape and Terminal Moraine do the exact same thing, be it the pay two to get the same effect. Then there's Is It Guildgate, Highland Lake, and Swiftwater Cliffs, each of which enter the battlefield tapped and tapped for either a blue or a red. On top of that, Swiftwater Cliffs is going to gain you one life when it enters the battlefield. Then there's Is It Boilerworks, which enters the battlefield tapped, and when it enters the battlefield you have to return a land back to your hand. This land will provide you some additional value though since it does tap for blue-red. And finally we're running 26 basic lands including 19 islands and 7 mountains. Alright, now that we've gone through every single card in the deck, let's do a quick price check. Our deck costs are calculated using TCG Player Optimization, optimizing with even heavily played and damage cards because those cards need a home too. The average EDH rec deck is going to set you back $107.49. Let's see how we compare to that. Our deck is going to be much more affordable at $24.95. Again, with these Commander's Quarters decks, they are built to be tuned and focused within that $25 budget, but there's always ways that we can improve on them. Let's go through what some of those ways just might be in our reasonable upgrades. Stony Brook Banneret comes in at $1.49. She's a 1-1 Merfolk Wizard with Island Walk and Merfolk spells and Wizard spells you play cost one less to cast. We are running a ton of Wizards in this deck and reducing their cost even just by a little is huge. Then there's Baral Chief of Compliance which comes in at $5.03. Baral is a 1-3 Human Wizard that costs one in the blue and has instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. Whenever a spell or build you control counters a spell you may draw a card if you do discard a card. Again lowering the casting cost of our spells in this deck just helps us be quicker and more explosive. Next up is Sapphire Medallion, which comes in at $8.16. Sapphire Medallion is an artifact that costs two and says blue spells you cast cost one less to cast. Almost every single spell in this deck is blue, so it's going to reduce the cost of a ton of spells for us. Then there's Venzer Shaper Savant, who comes in at $3.49. He's a 2-2 human wizard with flash, and when he enters the battlefield, we get to return target spell or permanent to its owner's hand. This enter the battlefield ability is crazy, and probably one of the best ones out of all the wizards that we have. If we can infinitely flicker Venzer, we can return every single other player's permanents back to their hands and just win from there. Then there's Kindred Discovery, which comes in at $8.13. It's an enchantment that costs 3 blue blue, and when it enters the battlefield we choose a creature type. Whenever a creature we control of the chosen type enters the battlefield or attacks we draw a card. This card's amazing in tribal decks, and we're going to choose Wizard, obviously. We have a ton of Wizards that are going to be coming into play, and we have a ton of Wizards that are going to be attacking. We will draw a lot of cards. Finally there's Panharmonicon, which comes in at $3.70. Panharmonicon is an artifact that costs 4 and says if an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Panharmonicon is just basically an extra copy of Naban and comes in huge for this deck. Again, with Adelise, there's plenty of directions that you can take a deck when building around her. And just because I built my deck in this way doesn't mean you can't take it in another direction. And with that, our show is coming to a close, but I really want to hear what you guys think about this deck, so why don't you comment below and let me know what you think. Also, make sure you follow us on both Twitter and Facebook so you can get some early hints on who the next commander just might be. And links to our Twitter and Facebook can be found in the description below. Also in the description below is a link to our Patreon page, and I just want to give a quick thank you to the patrons who have subscribed so far. There are many benefits to being a patron, including being able to vote on commanders for deck techs like this one. There's even a new general level tier where you get your own personalized deck tech episode dedicated to you. If you enjoyed this deck tech, please like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out some of our other deck techs. And with that, I'm out of here. Thanks again, and have a good one.